Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Bruce. I'm an alcoholic and a member of Al-Anon. We get a double winner here today. Um, I'm a Jersey boy. I'm living in California now. Um, I grew up in New Jersey. I'm uh, mom, dad, brother. Uh, I was a f- frightened little boy then, and I'm still a frightened little boy in an old person's body. And uh, I guess I should tell how long I've been here. Yeah, I'm, I've been 45 years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous and about 10 years in Al Anon. So I've had a lot of experience with the program. Um, and I'm going to tell you what it did for me. Uh, before I got to either any of the programs, I was always frightened and knew I was the problem, knew I didn't fit in. Um, nobody wanted me around. Uh, I had a father who was an alcoholic and uh, scared the hell out of me because I could never figure out why a nice guy who would be a wonderful man and take me to a Dodger game in Ebbets Field and we had a wonderful day and we come home and within a few minutes after we get home he's yelling and screaming and throwing things and uh, it scared the hell out of me. I didn't know what that was. Uh, I never did figure that out. Uh, I can remember my grandmother saying your father's a drunk. And I said no he's not. No he's not. So I defended him and uh, I spent a lot of time in my room especially when People were there. We had several generations living up under the same roof at times. And uh, that Saturday night or Sunday night, I'd go to my room and I'd just sit there and listen. What's going to happen next? What, when's this all going to start? Is it going to start? I'm just terrified out of my mind. And that's how I grew up. And uh, I was okay in school, but uh, I was scared because I felt I wasn't as good as the other kids. I didn't fit in. So for whatever reason, I was born. I was born with a lot of brains, I guess, but it never materialized because I had all this other stuff going on. And uh, you know, I, I grew up. I went to school, and I just got by. Uh, went to. I had enough grades to get into the local college. I, I went to Rutgers University, and uh, I didn't do very well there until the dean said, "Either you make this great boy average, or you're out of here." scared the hell out of me, so I did. I graduated from Rutgers, and the next thing I know, the military is calling me for a physical, because that's when the Berlin crisis began, and uh, all my buddies were being getting their physicals, and we were all classified 1A, and I knew the next step was to uh, be drafted, and that scared me more than anything else, and so I, uh, I was talking to this professor that I had used to work for at Rutgers, and he said, Bruce, he said, if you're willing to go to Seattle, I might be able to get you an occupational deferment because I'm doing work with a Boeing company. And I said, great. So next thing I know, I'm on an airplane to Seattle. Uh, before I left, a couple months before I left, my father passed at a very young age, at 53. Uh, I had a younger brother who was eight or nine at that time, and off I went. And I felt like I was abandoning my family. I never said anything. Nobody ever said to me, Bruce, don't go. But that's it. those are the feelings I took with me. Now, on the way, I had good feelings about, oh, it's going to be better in Seattle. I always wanted it to be better. It was never good enough when it was or where I was, but I knew it would be better in Seattle. And I got there, and I met the boss, and he gave me a little car to use for a little while. I found a, a, a Motel 6 room. I got a Motel 6 room for a while, and uh, I knew it was going to be better until I went to work the next day. And I knew it wasn't better because I didn't know what they wanted me to do. I knew they knew and they would know immediately that I didn't know what I was doing and that I was going to be found out. And that's the way I went. And some friends at work said, some of the people I met, they said, let's go have a drink after work. We got an Ivar's bar in Seattle. So we went off to Ivar's bar. And we did that a couple of times. And the next thing I know, I'm uh, wondering what happened after you got to Ivar's. And that was to become a... Uh, uh, a thing that I would say for the next many years was what happened after I started having blackouts the first year I began drinking. And 
for those of you that might not know, is a black, I could be having a blackout right now and you wouldn't know it, but I would not remember anything that went on. I would carry conversations on, but apparently not. And I didn't know what went on. And, you know, I would eventually come out of these blackouts in strange places and strange situations. And I immediately came to the solution that Seattle was my problem because it was dark and it rained there all the time and I need some sunshine. And at that time, uh, uh, the Apollo program was getting started in Southern California and a couple of the guys were going down there and I said, oh, please, can you guys get me a job down there? And within a couple of months, they got me a job. And next thing I know, I'm in this little VW I had and I'm off to Los Angeles because it's going to be better down there. You know, we got an apartment, went to the first day of job and immediately down there, I knew it wasn't going to be any better because I was still looking over my shoulder, still in full fear that they're going to find me out that I don't know what they, what I'm doing. And that just absolutely scared the hell out of me all the time. So the drinking progressed. And uh, yet in my job environment, I kept getting better jobs. You know, and, and I know this was a, every time I went there, I said, my God, I can't know how to do this. And uh, so I figured, well, my problem is I'm not married. Let's see, we can fix that situation. So I met the girl next door uh, to us in, in this little house in Redondo Beach. and. Uh, uh, first thing, on our first day, she said to me, I'd love to go out with you, she says, but I'm never going to get married. And I knew immediately that that was the girl for me. And so I pursued her until she finally said yes, or she asked me. I'm not quite sure how that happened. And, uh, you know, we got married, and it was great for a little while, anyhow. Uh, she fixed me a martini when I came home from work, and we sit down and talk about our day. She was a teacher in the school district down there in Redondo, and she'd complain about her day. I complained about my day. I drink, and she didn't drink as much as I did, but she would take some pills and stuff. And that was my life. And we said, okay, we need, that's the problem is we live here. We need let's go live by the beach. So we rented an apartment in, in, down in Marina del Rey at the beach. We had this great apartment overlooking the whole marina. And uh, guess what? It didn't get any better. And uh, in fact, it was. It went on, and we were married for almost nine years. And uh, so finally, I said, "Well, let's let's go buy a house so we have something for our future." And uh, so we bought a house with her parents giving us money to b borrow. We bought a house in L.A. and by Century City, and and she didn't like it, and I liked it, and I knew it was going to be better there. And so I had this job. The job didn't work out. I quit because I was angry and resentful. Uh, because the problem was is that I was so afraid of things that I couldn't make decisions. I just couldn't. I was so afraid that I would make the wrong decision that all my life I never made any decisions. And I can remember them calling me and saying, Bruce, we pay you to make decisions. And, and I couldn't do it. And finally they called me and said, well, we've got a better job for you in the company. And I got angry and resentful and said, I quit. And you know, next thing I know, I'm, I'm out looking for a job. And... Uh, you know, and uh, I, I had I got a couple of jobs, and that those didn't last very long. And I just kept drinking, and uh, you know, and and one day my wife said, "Well, it's Mother's Day tomorrow. Let's go down to my parents, and uh, it'd be nice to go down to the beach to where they live, and we'll take a present to her mom." And we did, and we got there, and I dealed, dealt everybody a, a hand of euchre, and we sat down to play euchre, I fixed everybody a drink, and that was around noon. And the next thing my, my brain turned on, remember it was black house. Uh, next thing I remember it's dark and I'm sitting on the edge of my bed back in our house, 30 some miles away. And I, what happened? We, you know, we're, I, I knew where I was, but I didn't know how I got there or what. And my wife wasn't next to me in the bed. The light was on, but I saw the light on in the bathroom. And I waited for a while, she didn't come out. And I finally I went and tried to, I called her, she didn't say anything. And I went to open the door and the door was kind of wedged closed and I pushed it, pushed it, and finally it opened and I uh, uh, found her on the bathroom floor and she was dead. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, is this a dream? I didn't know what it was, but uh, it wasn't a dream. And uh, it turns out she had taken a, a whole vial of two and all pills, which the doctor had given me because I couldn't sleep. And uh, she had taken one at one point in time and said, gee, that's a nice, that's a good pills. I could take some of those never occurred to me in my, I was totally so, so self-consumed that I couldn't show any feeling or concern for her. You know, I didn't know that at the time. And all I cared about was me. It was always about me, you know. 
if I let it be, it's still always about me. And uh, that's something I've fought ever since then. And so we got through the, to the funeral and everything. And, uh, you know, and I, uh, uh, you know, I didn't have a job and I had some money and I just sat in this chair looking out on our backyard. And once, every once in a while, somebody from work would call and come, or stop by and say, Bruce, how are you doing? And I just looked at him and I had no plan what to do. I had no hope it was ever going to be better. Nothing to do about it. Until one day, my mother called me from New Jersey and she said, Bruce, your Uncle Lou is coming out. Now, she said, before you say anything, I know you don't like him, but at least call to say hi to him while he's out there. And for whatever reason, he'd been out before and I never had anything to do with him. Out of my mouth came the words, no, I want him to come stay with me. I'm going to go pick him up, pick him up at the airport. Now, I didn't know that at the time, but that was the grace of God working in my life because I picked him up and he watched me for a day. And we went to the lawyer's office with the papers and uh, he, uh, he had to do everything for me because I couldn't do it. I couldn't make decisions about anything. And we went back home to the house. I picked up a quart of vodka on the way home to sit down and have a drink and visit with him. And he said, Bruce, when are you gonna get honest with yourself? Your problem is in that glass in front of you. And for whatever reason, I didn't throw him out. I didn't yell at him. I didn't scream at him. I listened to what he said. He said to me, Bruce, I have some friends that I worked with at the post office back in New Jersey. And uh, they, a couple of them go on to this program called Alcoholics Anonymous and it made a difference in their life. Maybe you should consider that. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'm calling the psychiatrist that, that my wife and I have been taking turns going to. And he said that, uh, um, he said that, uh, Bruce, he said, I, I told him I've been drinking. He, he used to ask me, have you, have you had, are you drinking? I said, yeah, I have a couple of drinks at night when I get home. Now, he has no idea what that what a couple, a couple of drinks means to an alcoholic, but you know, it could be a couple of bottles. It could be whatever until I pass out. And uh, that was the way that went. And he said, Bruce, he said, if you be an alcoholic, and you might be, he said, the medical profession can't help you. God's grace is getting interfering in my life because the medical profession can't help you. If you have a chance, it's with Alcoholics Anonymous, I suggest you call them. The next thing I go, I went to an AA meeting and uh, a guy came, picked me up. We drove to this meeting, it seemed like he preached to me all the way over. We went to the strange meeting place. The meeting was in an auditorium. It was behind this big curtain and I was scared out of my mind. And for whatever reason, I stayed until the meeting was over because I had no way to get back home. I stayed for the meeting and on the way home, he said, Bruce says, I'm not going to be here tomorrow. So you have to get a meeting yourself. And here's a couple of meetings right around here. And uh, next thing I know, I'm going to a meeting, one of those meetings, not because I would have on my own, but I didn't want my uncle to give me hassle about not going to another meeting. So I went to another meeting and at that meeting, God interfered again, put a couple of guys in my life who changed my life. You know, they saw me, they didn't know me. They welcomed me and they said, here, come sit here. And, they talked to me for a while and we're glad you're here and, you know, and, and come be with us, come do what we do and maybe your life will get better. Ours has gotten better. So that night after, after the meeting, the fellow said to me, uh, let's go have coffee. So we go have coffee and, and, uh, I heard something about, I said to him, what, what is a sponsor? And somebody said something about a sponsor. I don't know what that is. And, uh, he said, that's somebody that helps you get, get involved in the program and get going. And uh, I said, okay. I said, and I knew that if I left me, I would never call, ask him. I said, if I had blurted out, will you be my sponsor? He said, yes. He said, call me tomorrow and we'll get going. And, and, uh, or meet me here. Some, I don't know exactly what it was, but that changed my life. But that was a decision I, I resented every day of my life for the next year. Uh, because he was a very strong personality, a very gruff guy. He was an attorney. He represented Ginsburg and Hell's Angels. And he was just nothing I was ever used to. And he scared the hell out of me. And because I, I, I wasn't very good with people with loud voices, as you'll hear in my story. But uh, I had no choice. Meet me here. We'll go there. We went to the meeting. And I managed in that first year to get through my steps with him. And uh, I did an inventory. And the school said uh, that he's not going to graduate because he hasn't written three papers and he does, he's not going to graduate. I mean, uh, I'm telling Lynn's story here a little bit, but the school said he doesn't write the papers, he's not going to graduate. 
after all this time and all this money, you know. But what happened is a couple hours before the time, Linda called her sister in Las Vegas and said, you can come down if you want, but we might not have a graduation. Then she would yell at Linda and say, write the papers for him, write the papers for him. And we decided that no, she's not going to write the papers. We're not going to write the papers. Either he's going to graduate on his own or he's not going to graduate. And uh, again, that was the grace of God entering into our life because that was the best decision we could have made, made at that time. Because in an hour or two later, the school called me and said, oh, he's going to graduate. He was just funding you guys. He's trying to kid you guys. So you would think that he wasn't going to graduate. And we didn't think that was very funny. Uh, I see a little humor in it now, but I sure didn't see any humor in it then. And then we decided, right, we're both college graduates. He has to be a college graduate, except for one little problem. He said, I don't want to go to college. He said, I don't want, I hate school. I don't like to study. He said, why don't you spend $40,000 or $30,000 and buy me a shop and I'll be happy. And uh, we weren't in a place where we could say yes to that sort of a thing. So we didn't. So we convinced him he had to go to school. If he wanted to live and for us to pay for his expenses, he had to be in school. And uh, he went to school and came back and went to school and came back. Uh, and then uh, when he came back, he was living at home and his drinking got worse. And he had friends over and they were using and drinking. And, you know, and, and the th one other thing is that since from when he was a baby, he would go, to, go with me to an AA meeting every Monday night. Uh, and uh, he would help set up the chairs and he played basketball with somebody. And he loved the people at AA, you know. He loved the people at AA. And uh, so we told him, if you're going to stay in our house, we have a sober house. No drugs, no alcohol, or you're out. Well, somehow he got the indication, or he, he thought in his clever mind that the garage doesn't, isn't part of the house. So he could stay in the garage and he could do whatever he wanted. And that led to some disaster, too. And, uh, you know, it just got horrible. And it was during that period of time, we didn't know what to do. In fact, I think I started going to Alan on me during that period with Lynn uh, because we didn't know what to do. And, uh, we learned some things that we had to just let him be, let him do his thing. And, uh, uh, some things happened and, and we, uh, we didn't, we didn't cave to the situation he wanted. Little by little, it got better. You know, little by little, it got better. And uh, then he met at this one of the meetings where I went to another member of AA who builds props and has a shop. And he's been in that business for a long time. And he came to us one day and said, Bruce, you have a son, don't you? High school age? College age? Yeah. Would he be interested in coming and working in the shop with me? And he's been there ever since. He loves doing what he does in that shop. So he found a place, or God did. I think I found him a place, and uh, you know, and 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 that is that is how our life has evolved. And you know, I've gotten involved in AA and Al-Anon. We're involved with conventions. We, I, I got involved one year. Milton said that he, I was worried about. I was coming up on my second year birthday, and I was third year. I was coming up, on, and I heard people saying well, the, the terrible threes. Or, you, know, you, you better watch it, you're going to get drunk. And I'm still scared. I didn't want to get drunk. And I talked to Milton, and Milton said, I want you to call central office on every Tuesday. Carlos is down there only on Tuesday afternoons. You call him, and you tell him you want to go out on a panel. Now, I didn't want to go out on a panel. I didn't know what the hell a panel was, but I went. The next thing I know, I'm going to meetings out of panels, which is where we go. We take literature, and we go out to put on an AA meeting at the facility. And next day, I know I'm going all over Southern California. I know my Southern California geography by the facilities that I've gone to, you know, from Tehachapi to Chino to a whole bunch of places. And, and you know what? That has kept me sober. That has kept me involved in the program. I still go to a lot of meetings, and uh, I'm so blessed that I get to go there. And we've gone to a lot of conventions. So we've got it. We've got an AA family and al family all over this globe, and uh, you know, and this is kind of an example of it. And uh, we're just so truly blessed. And you know, again, 
God has, God has taken care of us. When I remember that, that constant thought of others saves the day. When I wake up in the morning, I'm still frightened. I'm a frightened little boy inside a body. But and then I remember what you told me. Go to meetings. Who are you going to help today? So I, for me, I've developed this little dialogue with God. I talk to him because he is part of me. He is inside of me. I say, okay, God, who do you need me to help today? And I listen for that. And I go out and when I help who I think or what I think, he says, hey, thank you, God. Who's next? What's next? Because it puts me in contact with this power. It gets me out of my head for a little while. It makes life a lot better, you know, and, uh, you know, how blessed I am. I, I'm falling down drunk. Here I am with a wonderful, wonderful life. And uh, like I said, I'm going to have a, a birthday next week for 46 years in Alcoholics Islands. My first time around. What a blessing. I didn't ask for it because I didn't know what it was. And thank God for Al and I. You know, I've learned some valuable questions that have put us in good stead. Why am I talking? You know? What, who asked me a question? If nobody asked me a question, shut up. Don't say anything. And uh, anyhow, I'm truly blessed. That's what, I'm going to stop here. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, um, hi, my name is Lynn Ann, grateful member of Al Anon. And the first thing you need to know is that we live in a two story house, his story and my story. So they don't always look the same. And uh, you know, I remember we used to go to we used to go to the movies and uh, we'd get out and he'd say, wasn't this part great? And I think, I don't even remember that part. And I'd say, wasn't this part great? And Hugh didn't remember. So that's just, you know, just the way it is. It's how we see life. Um, I did not grow up with any alcoholism. Um, I'm the youngest of three children. And what Bruce did not share is that I was comfortable because I have an older sister who is my natural sister. And then I have a brother who's our middle child who was adopted. So I was very comfortable with adoption. I didn't have, in fact, my brother and I look like we're, um, like we're, uh, we look like we were twins growing up. Now, when he did his family DNA, it could have been some weird stuff because we kept secrets back then that he may actually have come from a relative in our family, but mm, la, 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 nobody talks about that in my family. Um, I come from the fine family. We always had to be fine on the outside. If you watched us walk into holidays at the door, we're all, Everybody huggy, huggy, we look perfect, and all hell breaks loose inside, but we are fine at the front door. So I know how to put on that. I'm fine no matter what. Let me just look good on the outside. It doesn't matter what's happening on the inside. Um, um, I grew up, and, uh, and uh, my parents were uh, very loving. We didn't have a lot of money. Um, I had a lot of shame about that. I realized in Al Anon that because my parents didn't have a lot of money, there's nothing to be shameful. My parents worked very hard. They both worked seven days a week. They just didn't make a lot of money. And uh, what they taught us, uh, my sister and I were talking about this yesterday, how we both got really good work ethics from them. We both learned, I mean, my mother would say, now for those of you younger, you won't understand this. As long as your clothes are cleaned and ironed, you're good. You, it, it doesn't matter how many clothes or where you bought them or whatever. And so my parents have taught us really good values. And my mother was also a rager. And my mother ran the house. My mother would say, jump. And we would say, all say, we did it. My father and everybody. And, you know, interesting that I, I never wanted to be like my mother. I wanted to be like my father. Because my mother would be the one that would come to school and defend everybody. Everybody would say, hold on, bring your mom. And I'd be, I'd be embarrassed because she would tell everybody whatever. Anyway, um... And I also read slowly in school and I, I read slowly and my brother and sister used to tease me and tell me I was stupid. And uh, that lasted for a lot of years. So I didn't have a lot of self-esteem and, uh, but you know, we had a comfortable life. That's, that's all I can say. And so when I went to date, my mom said, um, you marry um, a professional who's your same religion and you'll be happy the rest of your life. So when I was 15 and a half, I took this poor 16 year old boy hostage because he was the man of my mother's dreams. And, um, and we went all through high school together and we went all through college together and, um, and we were gonna get married. And uh, I was graduating college in June and he wasn't gonna graduate until December. 
And, and I have to tell you, I have done some of the best things in my life with the worst motives and some of the worst things with the best motives. The only reason I have a college degree today is when I started college, my mother said, you are our last hope for a college graduate. And I was more afraid of my mother than any one of my professors in college. I, was, I could not go home and tell her I wasn't graduating. And that's the only reason I have a college degree today. And um, so um, I said to my mother, maybe we should post, we were getting married in July. I said, maybe we should postpone the wedding until he graduates. And my mom said, oh no, you'll never get married. You'll be an old maid. I was all of, I don't even think I was 21. I think I was 20. And, uh, and, and I believed her. And, uh, and we got married. And I have to tell you, this is the story of my life. I'm like Goldilocks and the three bears. My ex-husband um, didn't drink and he was too boring. I went to a practicing alcoholic and he was too exciting. And then I met Bruce and he was sober and he was just right. So that's, that's the, the long and store, short of it. Um, this is the part of the story I don't like very much. My, my ex-husband and I were married and um, we were both so boring. I used to think it was him. I used to blame him, but it was both of us. And, um, and I had, you taught me this word because it sounds much nicer than it was. I had an overlapping relationship with the practicing alcoholic. And, uh, um, and I'm not proud of that. And I, I've had a lot of guilt about that. But um, we, and uh, I believe today that man was brought into my life for two reasons. One was to get me out of that marriage so I'd be ready for Bruce. But the other reason was that when I came into Al-Anon, I don't know if I could have related that well because I had never seen Bruce take a drink. But I had done those things. I learned how to stay up till four in the morning waiting for somebody to come home and then pretending you're asleep so they don't know you were waiting up. Um, I, I know how to learn, live those, um, that denial of, you know, um, when uh, you say, where have you been? And we were at a friend's house and you see a stamp on their hand. And, uh, and you know, when you confront them, they say, oh, I went to a strip drink, but we didn't like it. We came right home. And I believe that. I believe everything he told me. And, uh, and you know, um, all of those, you know, this relationship was just, I mean, we were total opposites. And we tried to make it work. And I would do those dramatic things. I I don't like drama anymore now that I'm in Al Anon, but I do, you know, I would stamp out of the house and that was this was before cell phones. And for those of you who don't know what this is, you can Google it. And then I would drive around the block and I'd realize I'd have no place to go. So I would go to a payphone, call them up, and go back. And I I'm always made threats that I didn't intend to keep. And uh and we lived in this uh, you know, um when the when it was good, it was really good. But when it was bad, it was really bad. And uh, um, and I remember um, one night we he had his company. Well, what happened is we we lived together, and then we decided like uh, that if we didn't live together, and we just dated. Things would be good. So I moved back to my parents' house in the San Fernando Valley, and he still lived in West LA. And um, it was his company Christmas party. And I don't know how the alcoholics <laughs> I'm here got ready, but first they went out to lunch and started drinking. And then we had to meet at a bar after work so they could drink some more so they could be ready for the party. And so um, we don't give advice in al -Anon, but when you know somebody's drank that much and they say, leave your car at the bar, it's not a good idea, at least through my experience. And uh, so we went to the party, it was by the beach, which is 26 very long blocks from where the bar was. And uh, when he um, fell on the floor in front of his when he fell on the dance floor in front of his bosses, we thought perhaps it was time to leave. And we left and he drove down by the beach and he told me to get out of the car. And one thing that al has given me that I didn't have was choices. Never once occurred to me to call a taxi, to call a friend, to call my parents. My best thinking said I had to walk back to my car and that I couldn't go down a well-lit street because what if somebody saw me? My ego said, oh my God, somebody will see me. So I'm walking down this dark street and this, um, this man pulls up in a car and he says, um, he asked for directions and I didn't know where he was going. And then he made a U-turn and he said, look, you're obviously, you're obviously in trouble and need to get to your car. I'll drive you your car. I have another car that needs to be jump-started if you'll follow me over. This is the most unlikely story. And I do have to say I had, had, had some wine that night. And so I got in the car with this guy. And I have to tell you, if I, I didn't believe in God then, but God took care of me that night because that man drove me in my car. He um, he uh, had another car that needed to be jump started, and then he asked me for my phone number and called me the next day to make sure I got home okay. And um, I drove back to the valley, which is like 25 miles, 
drove back. My parents said, where have you been? He's been arrested for drunk driving. We need to go bail him out of jail. We drive all the way back that 25 minutes. I have no money. My parents have to put up the collateral to bail him out of jail. We bail him out of jail. We get in the car. I knew nothing about blackouts like Bruce talked about. And so he said to me, why did you leave the car, the party with the girl that I work with? And I, when I told him what happened, he called me a liar in front of my parents. And I knew, I knew I was done. So he drove home or he got home. I don't know. We, we drove him. He drove. And I drove back to home and I got home at like 2.30 in the morning. But you know what? I'm the on on. I got up at 4.30. I went to work the next day because I'm not going to miss work. I'm the responsible one. I go to work and, um, and I know it's over. I am like so done. This time it's over. And till he said these three magic words, which I probably shouldn't say to all the alcoholics, I need you. So now I'm, I'm back in there because, of course, now it's going to be different. He needs me. And it probably was for a couple of weeks. And, um, and I moved home in November, and this was in December. And in January, I was, 20, um, I was 25 years old. And in January, um, I got a call that my mother was killed in a car accident. And, you know, I'm so grateful that God had me come home from November till January. And I had that time to be with my mom, because when I was with the alcoholic, I, I isolated. I thought if my parents knew how I was living, they'd kill me, you know. And so I just did. I had, to, you know, I wasn't calling or anything. So God gave me this grace period to be with my mom. And uh, and so um, and then um, what happened is um, uh it, I was, I remember being at work and, uh, this relationship was falling apart and, um, and my mom had just died. And I remember walking down the hall and somebody saying, Oh, what's wrong? You're not smiling. And I just put that phony smile on one more time and said, Oh, I don't know. I must just be having a bad day. Cause I couldn't let you know I was dying inside. I couldn't let you know that. And then in January, um, this man called up and said he needed to go to the emergency hospital. And the doctor told us he had hepatitis. And, you know, my first thought was the guilt of, I love this man, but I'm glad he's sick because he won't be able to drink. And when he told me a month later, the doctor told me he could drink again, I believed him. You know, I believed everything he told me. And, um, and this relationship went on for, you know, I don't know, like another six months. And then Bruce told you, he asked me for my phone number. And um, when he called me to ask me out, um, I went out with the practicing alcoholic the next day and I broke up our relationship. And uh, it wasn't until Bruce asked me to marry him that uh, I, I met with that man again. And, and he said, you know, I can't tell you not to marry him because if it doesn't work out, then I will feel guilty. And I realized that this man was never going to be able to take responsibility. And, you know, when Bruce and I went out, when we went on our first date, I mean, he, he opened the door for me, he brought me flowers, he paid, you know, and um, he treated me really kindly. And, um, and I can still remember back then was when people just started wearing seatbelts and I wouldn't wear seatbelts because it would wrinkle my clothes and I have to look perfect. And, uh, and I remember Bruce saying to me, you know, one day you'll have enough self-esteem that you'll wear a seatbelt. And he, he must have said that to me for months before I started wearing seatbelts. You know, I never took care of myself that way. If you couldn't see it on the outside, I didn't do it. And uh, so anyway, actually, it was three months to the day after we got uh we met that Bruce it was on Valentine's Day because our first date was November 14th. And he took me up to the top of the mark in San Francisco. And we were having brunch and he asked me to marry him. And he said two things that I always had to remember. He said, first of all, um, my AA program will come first in my life. And I will go to four or five meetings a week for the rest of my life. And if you can't live with that, we can't get married. And I have to tell you, even with his 45 years of sobriety, he still goes from four to five to six meetings a week. Um, Tuesday night's our date night. One of our AA friends keeps trying to get him to go to Tuesday night meeting. I'm like, ah, 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 that's our date night. And, uh, and, uh, and he also said to me that if God wanted us to be together, there was nothing I was going to do to, to break us up. And if God didn't want us to be together, there was nothing I was going to do to keep us together. So if I, um, if I held him by his ankles, he wasn't going to stay. But if, if I gained five pounds, he wasn't leaving. So, um, but you know what? The best I could do, because I still had the guilt from my first marriage. I wasn't an Al-Anon yet. And I thought if I marry somebody else nice, I'm going to get bored and I'm going to screw them over. And I was so afraid that um, I didn't say yes. I said, let me think about this. Now, this is where our two stories switch. Uh, I don't know which is, I don't know what the truth is. It's been so many years. But 
like six weeks later, I thought I just decided, yes. Bruce said, he said, the train is moving on, get on or get off. Now, I don't know, this truth is probably somewhere in there, but I don't know what it was. You know, so we got married and um, Ruby, uh, Milton's wife, took me to my first Al-Anon meeting. And I was smug, arrogant, self-righteous. They said there were no children and I was resentful. I didn't have children, but, um, and they said, and, and this lady said, my husband dropped his socks in the living room and I didn't pick them up and everybody went, and I thought, oh my God, I must be in the wrong place. You know, I was like, I was 27 years old or 26 years old and I thought, oh, I must be in the wrong place. So it took me six months to to go to my next meeting. I used to follow Bruce to AA meetings because I thought that's what good AA wives did. They followed their husbands to meetings. Um, and um, six months later, I, we were at that Monday night meeting Bruce had. I used to hide in the bedroom because I thought if I heard their secret mumbo jumbo, they wouldn't come back to our house. I don't know why it never occurred to me to go out with a friend to do anything else. And I came down on the coffee break and someone said, this is Bruce's wife. And I thought, I have a name. All I am is Bruce's wife. Now, all I ever wanted to be was Bruce's wife. I had the house, the job, everything I thought would make me happy. And I still couldn't look in the mirror. So I went back to, my, I went back to another Al-Anon meeting. And it seemed to me everybody there was 100 years old. And, um, but um, I sat down and somebody sat across from me at like the small table sat across from me. And she was younger than me. And she stood up and she said her boyfriend had four and a half or five years of sobriety and that she'd never seen him take a drink and she was younger and God put her there to be my Eskimo because Bruce was at, at the same amount of sobriety at the time. And I said to her, are there, are there people with, um, are there meetings with younger people? And she said, Monday night, I'll be in Marina Del Rey. I'll have you a seat. So I went there. She goes, tomorrow night, I'll be in Culver City. I'll have you a seat. So I showed up. She goes, Friday night, I'll be at Chelsea and Wilshire. I'll have you a seat. I showed up. Now, I have to tell you, you didn't have to save seats at our meetings, but I showed up because she was saving me a seat. I'll be forever grateful to her that, that she did that for me. And, you know, I was not one of those. I love people when they say, I walked into Alan on and I felt at home. Not me. I used to come home from the meetings and I'd say, Bruce, how long do I have to go to these meetings? And he'd say, until you want to. And uh, But I did. I had seen his example about sponsorship, about uh, service and all that. So I asked somebody to sponsor me with six more months than I did in the program. And I asked them because I didn't want them to ask me to do things like go to meetings or work the steps. And she didn't. And when I called her once a month to check in, she was had a wonderful spiritual program and she shared that with me. And I, I'm forever grateful. But I do have to tell you, the thing I did learn was to be of service. When your meeting tells you you are ready to be of service, you do it. Don't, don't let your head say, oh, I can't do that, blah, blah, blah. And because I learned so much from service, my first service commitment at my home meeting was I was their inner group rep. I didn't know how to get to Monterey Park. Somebody picked me up. I can still remember this. And this was like 30 mm, something years ago. This lady drove me there. It, I thought they were speaking another language. I had no idea. I'm writing everything down. I didn't know it was in the announcer and nobody wants to hear you talk for 20 minutes. Anyway, at your meeting, they want you to just say, but anyway, I'm writing everything down and and I have a migraine headache and we drive back and there's an accident on the freeway. And I got home and I thought, I am never going back to these meetings. Never, ever, ever. Until she called me two months later, I'll pick you up. Okay, I'll be ready. You know, and I kept doing that until it got comfortable. And then, you know, I ran for service board chairman and I lost. And, uh, and I ran the following year and I lost. And, uh, and then they asked me to be on the service board for an extra year. Cause so this was my like, third year on the service board. And I remember calling an old time member of Al-Anon and saying, Oh my God, my ego hurt so bad. I lost twice. And he said, I said, what do I do? He said, go to your meetings and pick up cups and ashtrays and, and be humble. And I did. And the next year when I ran, nobody ran against me. So I guess I was supposed to have it. And so I, I spent a year um, doing that, but I, I also, at my home meeting, they asked me at, at one of my other meetings, they asked me to be food chairman. And, you know, at that meeting, they had like cut up fruit, everything. I mean, I used to walk up and down the aisles looking for the best cookies. I didn't know you don't file the, fire the cookie person, you know. But I have to tell you, if you don't want to take your four step inventory, get in service. Somebody will take it for you. Um, but um, what I did one day, I, I cut up all this fruit and I thought all of you made better looking fruit platters than me. Don't ask me how I knew that, but I knew. And so... I knew when people asked if they could help, I should let them. And so a newcomer came in and said, can I help you with this? And I said, oh, you can put the fruit out. They poured it in a mound on the tray. I'm here to tell you, everybody ate that fruit 
and nobody said one word. And I thought that was the first chink at my perfectionism. I didn't have to be perfect. So I have my one year birthday in Al-Anon and, um, and Bruce says to me, no self-respecting AA would have their first birthday without doing a fourth step inventory. And I said, I informed him that in Al-Anon we do it in our own way and pace. And so I was right on schedule, but I was feeling guilty. So I asked somebody to sponsor me who had 19 years in the program. And, um, and uh, she had a very different idea of sponsorship. Her favorite word was right. She said, we're gonna work the steps from one to 12 without skipping two to 11 in the middle. And so I, um, I wrote my four step inventory. It was long, it was boring. And, um, and I got to her house and she said, have you done the third step prayer? And I said, yes, I did it with Bruce. She goes, now you'll do it like an Al-Anon, does it with another Al-Anon. And we got on our knees and we did the third step prayer. And I read her my four step inventory. And you know, when I walked in there, I had no character defects. I was really good at victimese. I'm a great victim. Nothing was my fault. And, uh, and, and so she said to me, um, I've made a list of character defects I heard in your inventory. And she read them to me and she said, are you entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character? Well, people pleasing was on there. So I said, yes. So we did the seventh step prayer. You know, I have to still do the seventh step prayer on a daily basis and add God, ask God to remove those defects of character. Now they just come to visit. They're not with me all the time and I can recognize when I'm having one of those character defects. And then she made a list of all the people I owed amends to and she gave it to me and uh, to set me home. And I just want to share with you about two amends that changed my life. My life. The first amends was to that ex-husband. And uh, the first thing that happened, of course, was my worst nightmare. His wife answered, and I thought, I don't want her to think I want him back. And so I'm like, I'm in this 12-step program. I need to blah, 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 blah. And he didn't call me for like two days. And then he called me back. And what he told me changed my life. My sponsor said, you don't know what he knows, so just say, I'm sorry for my part in the breakup of your, our marriage. And I, and I said that, and he said to me, you won't, don't owe me an amends, we were really young. And then he said to me, you know, the hurt goes away. And he was the first person that confronted me with the fact that I could hurt somebody. And you know, I've walked a much narrower path since then. I was so worried about people hurting me, it never occurred to me I could hurt somebody else. And I have to tell you, the real amends I've made to my ex-husband is, because his family blamed him and everything, is that his sister is an Al-Anon and she's heard me talk and she knows the truth. And that set me free. Um, the other amends I made was to my father. After my mother died, my father became the swinging single of the San Fernando Valley. And uh, so when I told my dad, I dramatically gave him my amends. He said to me, did I tell you I have a date Thursday night? And I realized that that amends was for me. It wasn't for my father. And the real amends I made, I made amends to my mother's graveside. I wrote her a letter when I could finally, when I could finally make amends without saying, if you hadn't, if you hadn't done this, I wouldn't have had to do this. And I made amends to my mother's graveside. But the real amends we made is when Bruce and I got married, there's only one thing he said, I will never live in a house with more than one generation again, as long as I live. So when my father was diagnosed with leukemia, and my brother lived on a three -story, in a three-story apartment with no elevator on the third floor. And my sister lived in Las Vegas. We knew that my father would have to come live with us. And my father came and lived, lived with us for the last four years and four months of his life. And I have to tell you, um, you gave me the strength and courage to do the things I couldn't. I changed my father's diapers and I knew it was more humiliating for him than it was for, for me. We, the biggest mistake we ever made was we gave him a bell. He was ringing the bell every half hour and thinking that was a big mistake, but we took care of him the last four years of it, four months of his life. And I have to tell you, my, my father had a wicked sense of humor. He would tell jokes all the time. Everybody loved him. I had no sense of humor when I came in this program. I got my mother's serious side. I remember we had an AA or Allen on party and my sponsor was there. And she was sitting with my dad and my dad's telling her all these jokes. And she came up to me and she said, are you sure that's your dad? He's so funny and you're so serious. And I thought, so by the time my dad was, um, by the time my dad was dying, I had been in Allen and I got a sense of humor. And you know what? God let me give that back to him and make him laugh when he was, when he was dying. And you know, I, I, I learned how to love and accept everybody that everybody processes it differently. The doctor says to us, to my brother, my sister and I, you need to go in there and you need to tell your dad he can go, he's ready to go. And you need to let him know you'll be okay. My brother goes in there and does that. I go in there and do, do that. My sister lays on top of him and says, Dad, you can't leave us. 
and I and I had to let that go. I knew that was the best she could do. And because of Al-Anon, I didn't have to say anything and cause a big family brouhaha, you know, because when it was time, my dad went, you know, and I and I got to be there with him. And my brother said to us, I can't be there. And we called my brother when it happened. You know, you taught me how to accept everybody the way they are. So, um, and you know, um, by that time, Jason was in second grade. And I remember him saying to us, um, I remember him saying to us, me like six months after he, my dad died, he goes, you know, mom, I wouldn't have given anything to have Papa now, but I'm glad I have you back because I couldn't do it all. I couldn't be there for him and for my dad. And it was, you know, we can't, we can't do it all. And then I laughed because the next year when we when he went back to school in third grade, the mother said, well, you know, we gave you a break last year from being dead mother because um, because your dad was dying. But this year it's step up. So I had to be dead mother for fourth, third, fourth and fifth grade in, in Cub Scouts, um, you know, and and um, and Bruce told you our journey with Jason. And I, I have to tell you, the hardest thing when that first baby was taken back is I'd quit my job and all the things I had that made me okay, my job, my they, having a baby, I all of a sudden I had to be okay by myself. I had to, and, and people said to us, don't stop before the miracle. And that's why we tried again. So anyway, so um, I, I want to talk a little bit about... Um, about and I live in I live in um, 10, 11, and 12. I continue to do inventory and I and I pray and meditate and uh, and I try to carry the message. So um, when Jason um, was 12 and he started acting, it, it, you know, and we were in such denial, you know, we'd say, "Did someone burn fish in the house?" No, you idiot! Your kid's smoking pot. You know, I mean, we just wanted to be in denial, and. Um, and I lived in fear, such fear. I was always afraid Jason was going to die. Something was going to happen to him. And, you know, when he's, after they're 18, you have less. But before they're 18, you are responsible for them. And, uh, and he was hanging out with some unsavory people. And, I, and, and you know, it was just scary. And, uh, and so uh, when, he, uh, when he went to this private school, um, one of, one of the people I work with recommended the school and you had to be gifted or near gifted to get in and you had to be um, not survive, not have a reason you weren't, um, you weren't succeeding in a public school. And when Bruce and I went to look at the school, to us it looked like one flew over the cuckoo's nest, but Jason was really comfortable there. And when I, and I said to my sponsor, we can't afford private school. And she said, can you afford it this year? And I said, yes. She said, well, you better trust that God's going to give you the money the next four years. So um, so we trusted and, and God gave us the money. And uh, and uh, so he did, you know, he did graduate. And then he went off to school and he came back, you know, because we said he's not stupid. We said, we'll only support you if you're in school. So he didn't want to support himself. So we went. And in the meantime, um, that man at Bruce's meeting, Jason was 18 years old, asked him to work in the shop. And so God was taking care of him when I couldn't. At some point, I, I have an out on friend that describes this. His behavior outgrew my parenting skills. I couldn't do it. I, I was either angry, screaming. I, I didn't know I had so much anger and rage in me since I had the, since I was in the practicing alcoholic. And when he came home, um, and he would be, you know, one time he came home from college and, uh, and we don't snoop, but we walk outside and there's, uh, his cell phones in the bushes, which is never a good sign. And then we go to get in our car next to his truck is the thing that he had bailed himself out of jail. Now at this point, I, I probably had 25 years in al -Anon. I don't even know how much I cannot tell you this to, to this day, if I would have bailed him out or not, I don't want to sit here and say, I wouldn't have bailed him out. I don't know what I would have done. I'm grateful that God did not have put me in that situation that I had to decide that he bailed himself out of jail. You know, he never had to go to court, so I don't know what happened. I'm at my Thursday night Alan on meeting, and I get a call from my neighbor that the, the police brought him home. I guess he was disturbing. I don't know what he was doing, and, and they wouldn't let him in because he didn't have the key. So I, I drove home from my meeting, and I let him in the house, you know, and, and um you know, and, and, and some of the things that have more funny, some not so funny. And, and so when, when he came home when he was 18 and Bruce didn't tell you this, so he came home, he was 18 years old and he went crazy. I mean, I, he knocked two holes in doors in our house 
and he went crazy. We had we had suitcases. We had suitcase pack. We were going to leave. We didn't know what to do. And then all of a sudden he calmed down. And and but he said to Bruce. Bruce said, "If you do that, get him and call the police." And Jason said, and I never thought our family would survive this. Jason said, I will kill you before the police get here. And, um, and he calmed down and he said, I need to share something with you, but I'm afraid you're not going to love me if I share this with you. And he said, I've been smoking pot since I was 12 years old. But then he said, that's not what affected our relationship. Right. And, uh, and so you know, he calmed down and, and everything calmed down. And, um, and I, st but I'm so grateful for that because I started going to parent focus meetings in al -Anon and that changed my life. That's where I heard, wait for the question. Very rarely is there a question. He doesn't want me to, he doesn't want me interfering in his life. And, you know, Bruce always knows today when there's a question, because if I'm on the phone, I'll start doing the happy dance because I get to talk, but very rarely is there a question. And, you know, um, he went back and forth to school a few more times. And in the meantime, we were getting, we were throwing money at the problem, throwing money at the problem, throwing money at the problem, and getting more and more and more resentful about throwing this money at the problem. And what finally happened is, um, you know, I got to the point where I thought, I don't care if he ever graduates college, you know, and I, and I, and so um, what happened is, he went to work for that man. God was putting, put that man in his life. That man and his wife had been like a second set of parents to him. He's worked for them for half his life and he loves it and they love him. And you know what? I, I am so happy that God had a plan that while I was trying to force my will, God was, had a plan because he has his own higher power. So what happened is, um, you know, he's working for that man and, and, uh, he's drinking. We know he's drinking and, um, we get a call. We had just actually gotten back from Lake Tahoe. We were at our Saturday night meeting. We had just gotten in and Bruce said, come here. And we got a call from his boss that he was missing in Las Vegas. And, um, and so we drove home and his boss said, I have called, I've called all the hospitals. I've called the police. He did not have, doesn't have either. We called our sponsors and our sponsor said, all you can do is pray. And that's it. And I remember a page in now in our book that said, you just do what normally you would do. So we unpacked our suitcases, we ate our dinner, and we went to sleep. And, you know, when Bruce woke up in the morning, he was so calm that he had turned his phone off. And Jason had called him one in the morning, and he didn't even know he was lost. And I don't know what happened that night. I don't want to know whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. I don't want to know. But he was, but he was okay. And... Um, and, you know, and in here, in here, he, he got married and he had a, you know, he had a, he married somebody who had mental illness. I don't know if she drank, but it was horrible. I mean, it was horrible watching. They screamed and yelled at each other. It was a horrible thing. And, and I will be forever grateful that my ex-daughter-in-law cheated on him and asked for a divorce and would not take him back because he kept wanting to fix her because whether he needs AA or not, I don't know, but he definitely needs Al-Anon. And I, I'm forever grateful that she wouldn't take him back. But um, uh, he was in uh, Detroit. He, he was working um, at a four week job in Detroit and uh, in February where it's very cold. And he called me on a Tuesday morning before I went to work and he said, mom, either you need to come to Detroit and be with me or I'm gonna have to check myself in a mental hospital because he had just found out she had had an affair. And, um, and uh, so I went into my boss and she said, take the rest of the week off. And, um, and I got on a plane to go to Detroit. And of course they, the plane was delayed because there was a lot of snow. It's very cold in the Detroit. And, and uh, I call him in the morning and he goes, mom, you're not in Detroit. I said, no, I'm in Minnesota. I'm sure I will be in Detroit at some point, you know? And I flew to Detroit and you know, we had a really wonderful, um, five days together, and we were able to talk about things that we had never talked about, and I'll be forever grateful for that time with him. And, um, and you know, and today, he's 37 years old. I don't think he drinks, you know. Um, I don't know. I don't ever ask him. A couple of times last year, I thought he smelled alcohol on, my bre on his breath, and Bruce said he's 36 years old. So what? He's allowed to drink if he does, you know. And he, um, and he lives in his shop. And he works and he's, and you know, so I have to go back to that financial stuff because of the seven tradition that we're so 
you're, we're self-supporting our own volunteers here at contributions. So Bruce said, we're going to meet with this guy who's an AA and Al-Anon and he does financial planning. We're going to meet with him in, in a restaurant and we're going to tell him all our finances. I would have rather walked in that restaurant naked than tell anybody all the money we threw at Jason. And this is how God works and how, how, how God works in our lives. We sit down with this man and this man says, when my son was in college, and we were paying for everything. I go up and I'm visiting him in his apartment and his cleaning lady is cleaning his apartment. And I get home and my wife is scrubbing our toilets. And I thought, what is wrong with this picture? And so after that, we were free to tell him everything. And you know what? He helped us with our finances. He helped us, um, you know, he, and, and so he helped us get our, and it was a lot, there was sacrifices and a lot of things we had to do that we didn't want to do, but we did it. So we could get our finances back on track. And, you know, when Jason was 26 years old, God said to me one day, it's time. And I called him up very nicely. And I just said, you know what, Jason, if we continue to give you money like this at the rate we're giving it to you, we're never going to be able to retire. And you know what? From that day to this, he has never asked us for a penny. Now, I wish I thought I wish I'd done it when he was 19, but that's OK. You know, now I have to share with you four weeks ago, I got to retire. So I, I'm I'm so grateful for that. But um, um, what was I going to say? But what happened in, when I was in these parent focus meetings, I was listening and listening. I wrote two years of inventories about Jason. Two years. I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And what finally came out of those two years of inventories, two things. First of all, I had this, you know, because of our finances, right here I had this resentment. I was saying all the sweet things to him, but I thought he says the wrong thing. I'm yelling at him, you know. And so what happened is after two years, all of a sudden the light bulb went on. At 18, he clearly told us that he did not want to go to college. It was on us. We didn't listen to him. We gave him all that money to go to college because we wanted him to graduate. He told us he didn't want to go to college, and that was on us. And all of a sudden that resentment lifted. I didn't have that resentment against him. The other thing is I got some compassion for him because I thought, Here, here's this child who knew we valued sobriety more than anything in the world, and yet he couldn't stay sober. And and um, and uh, and I and I got compassion for him because I know that child never once drank at us. He drank because he needed to do that to survive. It wasn't that he was doing it. I know that child loves us, and I have no doubt about that. And um, and you know, uh, the program has been about acceptance, acceptance of everybody in my life the way it is. You know, today I'm more active in the program than I ever have been. I'm working on three conventions. I sponsor a lot of women, and um, and I have a sponsor. I did change sponsors one more time. I was still overburdened with responsibility, and my sponsor is the funniest person I know, and she's sponsored me for a lot of years. And if you do not believe in sponsorship, I will tell you, when Jason was 18 years old my um, or 19, my sponsor's husband passed away, and when we were at the funeral, we were walking through the line. I heard him say to my sponsor, thank you so much, Yvonne. I would, my parents would have killed me if it was not for you. And he was probably right, you know, and cause she was the one who said to me, that's not a big deal. This is a big deal. And uh, she taught me when, the, when we had, when I called her and said, he might not graduate high school after we spent all that money. She said to me, did you give him that money for fun and for free? Or did you have expectations? Oh, I had expectations. She said, well, you better have done it for fun and for free because he may never have, he may never graduate. You know, and the reason I couldn't, didn't write those papers is because when I went back to graduate school in college, my family even helped me and they always took credit for it because they thought it was, I read so slow, poor me. And, uh, and I was a good victim. I played that. But when I went to graduate school, I did it all myself. And I knew what it felt like to stand up there and get that diploma on my own. And I was not going to deprive him of that, that. I was not going to deprive him of saying, oh, we helped you get through high school. No, you either get through it on your own or you don't get through it. Those are all lessons you taught me. You know, it, you taught me. Um, and, and, you know, life goes on. You know, we have a great life. We've gotten to travel. We've gotten to do, uh, you know, I love Bruce more today than I did 40 years ago when we got married. But, you know, life, life has its challenges. And this year, um, you know, when I was in my last six weeks of working and I was stressed to the max, um, our heat and our heat went out in our house 
And, and then we found out when the gas guy was here that we had mold in our house and we had to have our house, we had to have all this done to our house. And while we were doing that, Bruce was diagnosed with, they found a cancerous growth on his bladder and he had to go through cancer surgery and, and um, you know, and all that's happening. So life still happens. The program doesn't tell you life's not gonna happen, but what the program tells you is that, um, that there will be people there with you no matter what. And there were, there were people with us the whole way along the way. You know that you have friends in program when um, the doctor sent him home with a catheter and told me I had to take it out on Saturday or he had to keep it in until Monday. And I called one of my online friends and I said, you're a retired nurse. Will you come take this catheter out? She said, you know, I'm worked on the heart because I don't want to work on that part of the body. And I said, yeah, I know. And we all started laughing and she came over with her husband and took the catheter out. You know, that's friends. I mean, I got to tell you, that's friends. And, um, you know, and um, here is, is my very good news. Um, last week, we went back for Bruce's three-month um, cancer check, and he was cancer-free. So I'm forever grateful. You know, and, and Bruce is obviously, he's, you know, Bruce is going to be um, 84 years old. I'm 67. And you know what? There are... There are things, you know, I, one of the reasons I retired was I knew he needed my help at home. And although he has not retired, he still works. But, um, uh, but you know, he has a valve that's going to have to be replaced. And, you know, we were like living like we can't do this. We can't do that. What if what when when's it going to be the time we've looked for two years and we decided the other day, you know what, I'm tired of living in fear. I'm, we're just going to do what we do. And when God wants him to have the valve replaced, we'll know. That's what the doctor says. So we have to trust the doctor. And, you know, um, neither one of us is sh are as sharp as we used to be. You know, he may now made me the CEO of the finances. That would never have happened years ago. And, you know, um, um, we have a good life. I, uh, my, um, I heard a speaker say that, um, that we keep working the steps when we work them with our sponsees. And I have a Zoom meeting every Wednesday night with my sponsees. And, uh, and we're working through, we worked through the traditions, we were through, through the concepts of service, and then we're back working the steps again. And it's wonderful because I can go back and I can work my steps. And it's amazing how we change each time we work the steps, we peel that onion and, uh, and, we, and, we, um, and we go on. And, um, and there's always more to learn. I mean, one of the things I love about being retired is I can go to more meetings. And um, through my inventories, I also realized that, um, that's our train that goes by, um, that uh, I needed to live by the beach, that, that that's where my happy place was. So like any good program people, who else would move during the pandemic? So we decided to, during the pandemic that we were gonna move. and. Uh, and we downsized and, uh, you know, we always had the big party house everybody went to, and then we downsized to this very small beach bungalow type house. And I remember the first time someone walked in and said, what a cute little house, <laughs> my ego, my ego, you know, but that's what I wanted was a cute little house. And, you know, we lived by the beach like I always wanted to every morning, except for like when we have things like this, we take our books, we take our, um, we take our books and we, and we go down to the beach and we take our bagels and our coffee and we eat our bagels and coffee on the beach and we read our prayer and meditation books and we, we pray and we meditate and, uh, and, and it's, um, it, it's glorious. And, you know, today I can tell you who I am. When I came into this program, if you asked me what color I liked, I couldn't tell you that. You know, today I can tell you that I'm all different. I love watching Hallmark movies, but I'm a huge college football fan. I will be the ugliest screaming, yelling fan, not ugly, screaming, yelling fan in the stands. But I also like that I have different sides to me, and that's okay. And, um, and you've taught us that we all have fears, but we just walk through those fears. And one of the things I heard a couple of weeks ago that I loved was this lady said, we pause, we pray and then we let it pass. And I would pause, I'd pray, and then I'd try to force my solution. So now I'm learning to pause and to pray and just let it pass. And, um, and you know, we get to, in, in Al-Anon I've heard, we get to laugh together about what we used to cry alone about. And there are no secrets. I believe every experience I have had, good, bad, or ugly, it's because I'm supposed to share it with somebody else. 
that's why God gave me the experience. I remember one thing, I, I don't even remember what it was, but there was something I wrote in my fourth step and I thought, I read it to my sponsor. I have never, ever, ever, ever sharing this again. And like two weeks later, somebody I sponsored called me and said, I know you could never have had this experience, but I thought, are you kidding me, God? Are you really kidding me? You want me to share this again? But I did. And that's what it's all about because we all come in here broken and we, and, and the reason we do the fifth step is to hear me too, me too. We may all have done different things, but we all had those same feelings. And I heard a speaker describe it so well. They said, the reason we do the fifth step is because we all have these two people. We have the person that we want the world to believe we are, that wonderful, that everything's perfect. And we have that person that we feel like we're a piece of shit and we're worthless. And when we do the fourth and fifth step, we smash them together and we get a human being because that's what we all are. And that's what we get to do. And I just want to end with um, my, um, one of my things that changed my life was Winnie Eddy, who is a longtime passed away member of Al-Anon. She said once that her, her sponsor asked her how she, how she served a cake. And she said, I give everybody else a piece and whatever's left I take. And her sponsor said, did it ever occur to you that um, that's how you live your life? You give everybody a piece and you take whatever's left. So you know what? Today I take that first piece of cake and then I give everybody um, everything that's left. And um, thank you, McCall, so much. We're so glad we got to meet you at the convention. And thank you for asking us to speak today. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.